Grammar Girl is brought to you by the Taylor app. Do you ever stare into your closet full of clothes and still feel like you have nothing to wear? Imagine if your most fashionable friend were on call to help in those moments. With the Taylor app, you connect with a personal stylist and shopper on demand, free. From outfit suggestions to help shopping for new pieces, your Taylor stylist is ready with advice tailored to your taste, budget, and body type. Head to meettaylor.com slash grammar to download free today. That's M-E-E-T-T-A-I-L-O-R dot com slash grammar. Grammar Girl here. I'm Mignon Fogarty. This week, I have a quick and dirty tip about the difference between purposely and purposefully, and a meaty middle about the Yuletide. A listener named Manasai says she's been avoiding the words purposely and purposefully because she isn't sure of the difference between them. I know that problem. I used to avoid words like that before I became Grammar Girl, but it's better to learn how to use them. So let's break it down because the difference can be subtle. First, both purposely and purposefully come from an old French word that meant intention. And they're both adverbs, which means they're usually describing how you do something, how you do the action of the verb. Purposely is the word you want when you're describing something you're doing deliberately or intentionally, something you're doing on purpose. For example, if you know your sister is always late, You may purposely tell her the party starts 30 minutes earlier than it really does, so she gets there on time. And here's an example from the comedian George Carlin. He said, quote, A lot of times when a package says, open other end, I purposely open the end where it says that, unquote. He does it on purpose. Purposefully describes the action or demeanor of a person who's determined or resolute. If you want to convey a message to your brother across the dinner table without speaking, you may purposefully raise your eyebrows. Here's an example from the book Will Tanner, U.S. Deputy Marshal. He walked purposefully toward the horse, looking it in the eye as he untied the reins from the rail. It seems to me that purposefully is usually describing some kind of physical action, like walking, looking, staring, speaking, and so on. But that's not a hard and fast rule. You can also do things like communicate purposefully and live purposefully. Here's another example from the novel Night Talk. A woman wearing a knee-length black cashmere hooded overcoat and boots walked quickly, purposefully, down Los Angeles's Broadway Theater District. As I was looking for examples, I found a lot of people using purposefully when they really meant purposely, on purpose, and not nearly as many errors in the opposite direction. So you probably need to be more careful with purposefully. Here's how I remember the meaning. Think of purposefully, purposefully, as meaning full of purpose. Imagine a gesture full of meaning, those raised eyebrows or an athlete full of determination. The shorter word is simpler. Most of the time, purposely just means someone did something on purpose. Before we get to Yuletide, thank you to our sponsor, Warby Parker, an innovative eyeglasses brand that makes buying glasses online easy and risk-free. Glasses start at just $95, including anti-glare, anti-scratch prescription lenses. And for every pair you buy, they give a pair to someone in need. Their home try-on program lets you order five pairs of glasses to try on, and then you send them back with a free return shipping label with no obligation to purchase. Their prices are really a great deal, so much less than I've paid before. And being able to try the glasses on at home is convenient, I don't feel rushed or pressured by a salesperson, and it makes the whole process risk-free. Head to warbyparker.com slash grammar to order your free home try-ons today. When your trial frames arrive, choose the pair you'd like to order and send the frames back. And if you have an iPhone X, you can get Warby Parker's app to use their Find Your Fit feature. The app uses your iPhone camera to measure your face and recommend the best frames that will look amazing on you. 
Go to warbyparker.com slash grammar to get started today. Next, we're going to get into the Christmas spirit by talking about the word Yule. You've probably heard this word hundreds of times. The Christmas song, for example, celebrates Yuletide carols being sung by a choir. And Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas suggests we make the Yuletide gay. You can even spend hours in front of the TV watching the virtual Yule log on YouTube. We get that. We've done it too. In any case, what does Yule mean? It's a synonym for Christmas. If you wish people Yuletide greetings, you're wishing them Christmas greetings. And that weird ending, that's just an old-fashioned way of saying time. Yuletide means Yule time. The roots of Yule go back a long way. It comes from the Old English word Gyol, spelled G-E-O-L, which referred to Christmas Day or the Christmas season. It's also related to the word Giola, G-E-O-L-A, which referred to the months of December and January. A 7th century monk known as the Venerable Bede is the first recorder of this word. He described how the ancient Angles, a Germanic tribe who settled in Great Britain in the 5th century, divided the year into two halves, defined by the solstices. They called the month before winter solstice Era Giola, and the month after it Eftera Giola. By the way, in case you didn't know, the summer solstice is the longest day of the year. It occurs on June 21st or June 22nd in the Northern Hemisphere. After that, days get shorter and nights get longer. The winter solstice occurs on December 21st or 22nd, again in the Northern Hemisphere, and it's the shortest day of the year. After that, the days get longer and the nights get shorter. For the Southern Hemisphere, flip those around. This leads us further into the history of Yule. You see, this word is also related to the Old Norse word Yule, spelled J-U-L. Yule was a festival of the winter solstice, celebrated by Anglo-Saxons and Scandinavians. In the northern parts of Europe where they lived, the winter sun rises as late as 11 a.m. and sets just a few hours later. We can only imagine how oppressive that darkness was without electric lights. Yule was a celebration of, literally, brighter days to come. Over time, the winter solstice became the major festival of northern Europe. It was celebrated with traditions that sound suspiciously familiar to those of us who celebrate Christmas. For example, there were elaborate feasts, especially with roast pig. These may have represented sacrifices to the Norse god Freyr. After all, he was responsible for creating bountiful harvests, health, and peace. Furthermore, Freyr was usually depicted with a golden bristled boar, named Yulemberste beside him. Festive greenery, cue holly and mistletoe, were also used to decorate for Yule. Holly was said to keep away evil spirits and witches. Mistletoe was believed to have magical powers of healing. In one story, mistletoe was used to both kill and revive Baldur, son of the Norse gods Odin and Frigga. Mistletoe berries are sometimes said to have come from Frigga's tears. And after Baldur was revived, Frigga declared mistletoe to be a symbol of peace, friendship, and love. And of course, people celebrated the coming of longer days by lighting huge bonfires, or sometimes just burning special logs on the hearth. These were often made of oak, in which Scandinavians believed lay the origins of humankind. You can think of these fires as the earliest versions of the Yule log that we know today. As Christianity rolled across the land, many people let go of their quote-unquote heathen beliefs and accepted this new religion. But they were loath to let go of their ancient traditions. And so feasting, the hanging of holly and mistletoe, and the burning of a Yule log were rolled into Christmas and became part of that holiday's traditions. By the way, you may be glad that some of the Yule traditions didn't continue. These included running around wearing animal masks, hanging dead male animals from trees, and placing the severed head of a sacrificed horse on a pole. Yikes. 
And in case you're wondering how this all comes back around to Christmas, here's the deal. No Christian churches claim to have any record of the actual date of Christ's birth. Early Christians didn't seem to care about this too much. Some even ridiculed the concept that a god could have a birthday. That changed in the 4th century AD, when we find the earliest record of people holding a nativity festival. It was in Rome on, guess what, December 25th. That day coincided with both the winter solstice and the festival of Sol Invictus, the festival of the unconquered sun, which celebrated a pagan sun god called Mithra. We don't know for sure who in the Christian church decided that December 25th should be celebrated as the birthday of Jesus. They may have chosen this day to turn people away from the worship of the actual sun to the worship of Jesus, also known by Christians as the Lord of Light. Or this may have just been another example of the church, quote, tolerating and absorbing pagan customs as it spread over pagan lands, unquote. In sum, the word Yule actually has a rich and ancient history, and it shows that even before the advent of Yuletide, humans have always found a reason to celebrate, even on the coldest, darkest days of the year. That segment was written by Samantha Enslin, who runs Dragonfly Editorial. You can find her at dragonflyeditorial.com or on Twitter as dragonflyedit. I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. You can find me online as Grammar Girl at Twitter and Facebook. And you can find all my old articles and podcasts at quickanddirtytips.com. And in case you can't remember a specific offer or code, you can now find links to most of my advertisers at quickanddirtytips.com offers. That's all. Thanks for listening. Okay.